before we dive into the Pyrosolver, let's take a look at our colliders. Remember, colliders, 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 one of the most important part of your simulation. So the first one that we have, sorry, my hoodie is on manual. Let me go into on auto update and let me go look through the camera. This is our volume that we created, Heli RBD sim volume cached. Remember, we created uh, SDF VDB's collision and volumes from our simulation. So this is what I have here. Let's look at them. Perfect. We have collision and we have V. They, they will serve as colliders, but we also have buildings that we turned into volumes before. And the ground, we will just have a flat ground uh, clipping in the solver itself. What you will notice, though, is I'm plugging into my pyro solver only the helicopter. What I noticed is if I do VDB combine here and combine these two volumes, sometimes the solver is having a hard time um, simulating with both of them because these are pretty big uh, VDBs. You can see the buildings are 1,659 uh, voxels in one side in Z direction. And this one is also gets quite quite big, okay, almost 900 voxels. But uh, what I've gotten accustom accustomed to doing is breaking up my colliders and not merging them, but adding them as separate static objects to my solvers. So what I do here, let me just go a little bit before my solver is going to start. And uh, one that is the dynamic one, the helicopter, I'm adding here to the solver. It could be either one. I'm just choosing to put this one into the collision input. And then I'm diving inside. And you can see here I'm going into the docnet. And I'm adding an extra static collider. And this static collider is this outbuilding snarl that I just showed you earlier. So I, I, this node was not here. It was like this. I added a node here. And I'm uh, referencing my... Uh, buildings and I'm using a simple volume sample here and in this volume sample I am doing I'm, I'm adding my proxy volume here so uh, and here this collider is brings whatever was plugged into the collision input into the solver easy so just note every time you go through the setup and if it's read on the solver it means something was changed inside the solver manually it means I right clicked did um, allow editing of contents. It's not visible here now because it was already clicked. And then I dove inside, but I tend to mark the nodes that I dove inside with red. So you can always trace your steps. Now let's take a look at the solver itself. As I mentioned to you, global substeps, that was one parameter that I went with back and forth before. And what happens here is if you look at our RBD explosion, in the first few frames of uh, the impact, the helicopter pieces, they move extremely fast. And also our rotors are moving extremely fast. So I want to capture this rotor movement in my explosion. I tried other renders before, and I'll show you how it looked. If you look at this older render, you will see that we get this saber tooth zigzaggy pattern, pattern in the helicopter. It's because the helicopter collider was not sampled enough times and we get this strange shape. That's why I'm sampling it, sampling it four times between each frames. And just a reminder, um, I assume some of you might not remember that if you want your colliders to be sampled x times between the frames, this is your global substeps. If you want the pyro voxels to think more where to go between the substeps, these are your max substeps. Different things, right? If I uh, kept my global substeps at 1, but cracked max substeps to, let's say, 10, my collider, the rotor, would be still sampled one time between the frames. Okay, so if you want more collision, um, and more information from your colliders between the frames, global substeps is your best friend. Max substeps, I have them at 3, because, again, the, uh, my explosion expands really, really fast, and I just uh, wanted to have all the beautiful detail and uh, fine movement between the frames when everything happens there. In the collisions, we set our collision type to SDF plus volume velocity, because that's what we give it in both cases, for the buildings and the for, for the helicopter. It is an SDF, and we have collision volume and V volume. This is what we have here, collision and V. 
this is what Houdini expects. So always double check when you give it colliders before you run any PyroSim. If there is a name mismatch, either change the names here or change the names here, but they need to match. Okay. And I told you for the ground, we will just do Y ground playing, playing closed below. And in our shot, the ground is at zero. So this is easy. After that, let's look at our sourcing. We have some density that I'm sourcing at the scale of 15, so a lot of density. We have some trail density. These are our um, trails that happen at the beginning of the explosion. And again, the values of what is the scale for the sourcing that was trial and error and trying and running a bunch of different simulations. This is not something I know by heart. And this is not something that uh, you will remember the number and use it again in a different simulation. It's a trial and error every time is different. Yeah, that's our trail density. Then we have uh, our temperature that we are sourcing here as well. We have burn that we are sourcing into flames, but this is very usual explosion uh, sourcing workflow. Nothing really extraordinary. Same for the burn into divergence in the beginning. And our burn exists only for three frames, so we don't need to animate or change the scale because after that burn just disappears. We have some initial velocity that we are sourcing. And this is the last custom one. We have the top rotor wind. And you see I'm sourcing it with a really low scale because it's something that needs to be subtle. But this subtlety, I feel, adds a lot of uh, beauty to our explosion. Then let's look at what we are doing here in the fields. We are lowering our dissipation. And uh, we are emitting some temperature from the flame which means that in the beginning we have a burn that reacts with temperature, we have some flames, and then those flames will have temperature emitted from them. Okay, and we are increasing our flame lifespan to four. It means it takes four seconds for the flame to die off. And then also nothing extraordinary in our shapes field. We have some buoyancy explosion. Obviously, it needs to go up. Uh, because the, it's very, very hot. And then I'm adding some disturbance here. In this regard, this is actually not an animated feel. I'm going to remove the animation here. But uh, what I'm doing is actually using my uh, speed uh, control field, which is turned on here in the fields. If you scroll down, by default it's on. So it means inside the solver is going to compute a speed field, which is just the length of the velocity. I'm using it to control my disturbance. And by default, the disturbance is set to 50. But what I'm doing here, I'm actually animating the control field here. And when I'm starting, uh, it means that my disturbance is going to be ramped from speed between 0 and 3. So even the areas that are 0 0.1, they will still get some disturbance. Okay? But later, as the explosion progresses, I'm ramping this control range starting value to 0 0.75, which means now I'm saying that at the speed of 3 meters per second, have maximum disturbance. At the speed of 0.75 meters per second, disturbance should be 0, which means if the speed is between 0 and 0.75, I will have 0 disturbance. And that, again, came from some experiments back and forth. I was getting too much disturbance uh, ten, after 10 frames into the explosion. Okay, So this was my way of calming it down, because I had some areas which were quite uh, calm and not moving too much, but the disturbance looked on them a little bit over the top. And after that, we have a turbulence field, which is pretty much our wind. We are keeping the swirl size quite big, uh, 10 meters because this is a pretty large scale explosion. And then we are changing the values from 10 of turbulence in the beginning and 15 frames into the simulation, the value is 0 0.75. So it starts with really, really think of it, really strong wind. And then after 15 frames, the wind is really, really calm and it looks like a little bit of an atmospheric wind, like the leaves are just moving a tiny bit on, on a tree. That's what's happening here, and that gives us really interesting movement in the beginning, but it won't make our explosion move like crazy afterwards. It will look quite natural. Uh, then I'm adding a little bit of shredding here um, to my um, explosion to the temperature field, and that's it. 
there is nothing else that was changed here in the shape field. Let's go to the output tab and in the output uh, we do not need to export speed field. What we really need is density, temperature, flame and velocity. We will use the top three for shading and the last one for motion blur. And for velocity, thank you very much side effects for, for putting all of that into the pyro solver. It is so convenient now that our velocity field is being resampled and uh, everything is converted to 16-bit uh, floats and VDB. So if I load the caches, you can see what's actually happening here is my velocity is downsampled, twice less resolution than other fields. And if I go a little bit further, you can see here is my explosion. Uh, disregard everything that's happening here in the viewport. We cannot judge it here because really we will be rendering everything in Karma. We are shading this explosion in Karma and we'll take a look at its proper look in Karma in a second. But before we do that, let's not forget that we have our explosion, but we also had these temperature trails that we created, remember? So I am... And here you have temperature and velocity. These are our trails that I wanted to add back into the simulation because they will have really nice um, bright tips on the edges. And here we have our um, explosion that also has density, temperature, frame, and velocity. So we have a few fields that are repeating now. You see we have temperature and temperature, velocity and velocity, which means that we have to combine them. We're combining velocity now together. We are just adding them. And then we are combining our temperatures as well. I'm also adding them. And after that, I am clipping it by my camera, just in case this is uh, something, this is just my habit. I always clip my simulations, uh, pyro simulations. You can see I'm actually giving quite some padding on the sides, but sometimes you will have some rock piece that might flew a thousand meters somewhere away and it might make your render super super slow. So instead I am just giving it some padding and I'm clipping the farthest point. So 300 meters from camera, beyond that clip everything. And again those numbers are not coming from nowhere. I checked that in my simulation no essential part of the seam is going to be clipped that way. Here we go with the explosion. Next let's check how Awesome, it's gonna look in the render. Let's go and look at our lob test 007 where we already have an explosion brought in. I'm putting the visibility flag on the assigned material and I'm running a Karma XPU. So you can see here is my explosion. I can see my uh, helicopter geometry. First thing I'm noticing that the helicopter geometry doesn't have any motion blur. And let's see if we can change the look of our explosion a little bit. So first you will see that in the material library, if you dive inside, there is a new explosion material. And I started with pressing tab and typing pyro. And we have a few Karma pyro materials and I used a Karma pyro explosion material. That's what I started with. And then I made some adjustments. If you go inside, we can change, for example, uh, our intensity of the scatter. Let's change and see that it is actually working. Yes, indeed, it is working. Our explosion is uh, changing. So you can play around and see what you would like to adjust in this explosion. Maybe this is more realistic. It would not be that hot uh, 15 frames into the explosion. Most likely it will look something like this already. But feel free to play around. It's very simple and intuitive. If you play it with Pyro Bake Volume or any other Pyro Shaders in Houdini, you know what to do. And after that, I told you we still don't have the motion blur in the geometry. And most likely, if in the end we will be rendering, we'll need to double check how several objects work together with motion blur. And I told you that, remember, there are several ways to create motion blur in Houdini, one through cache node, one from motion blur node. And this is the case where I'm using cache node. And you see the way I'm doing it is I'm adding a cache node to the stream. One second, my Houdini is just uh, computing. I'll let it do that. But this cache node is added to the heli RBD stream. So I'm bringing the geometry of the heli destruction and you can see right away the motion blur starts working. Let's go back to our material. It's hard to judge. It's too bright, too bright. Give it a second. 
and let's pay attention to this piece on the right. It will tell us if motion blur is working, and indeed motion blur is working. But what is happen happening here is through cache node, I'm creating my subsamples only on this RBD geometry. I'm not creating them on um, the explosion because in the, on the explosion, I really don't need it. On the explosion, what I really need is just the velocity blur and the volume. So let's remember here, I have the subsample um, subframe data. On the hell explosion, I do not have them. I merge them. I add materials. After that, what I do is I'm using render geometry settings. And there, on the heli RBD, I am hard coding that no matter what will be set in the Karma render settings, please note that for this heli RBD, we do not need any velocity blur. It means we need a deformation blur here for which we were getting our subframe samples. Yeah, that's why I'm setting. I'm saying that no matter what, does <laughs> disregard whoever tells you what, this piece of geometry does not need velocity blur. And we do that because to get the velocity blur on the explosion, for it to work, we need to turn it on on the Karma render settings. So we turn it on, but not for the helicopter, because here we set some rules and I said, even if someone after tells you that, do not set the velocity blur on the helicopter. So now we have proper velocity blur on the volume and we have deformation motion blur on the geometry of our helicopter. Perfect. Everything is working as we expected.